Dennis Karacha at his business, Cuvée Chocolate. Now this is a hidden gem here in Melbourne that you may not be aware of, but what you may not also know is that Dennis actually came third in the World Chocolate Masters in Paris. His chocolate skills are absolutely phenomenal and he's putting them to work here in his own business, creating chocolate bars with bean to bar. Now Dennis, I've got a few questions for you. Yeah, shoot out. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? Born and raised in Germany, started my apprenticeship when I was 16 and been doing pastry ever since. And so I've put my focus on chocolate probably for the last 10 years of that. Now you came third in the world in the World Chocolate Masters, which is a huge accolade to actually win, a lot of work and preparation. Having been successful in that competition, did that change things for you career-wise? Um, yeah, I think it did to a degree. Um, Obviously, the, the training alone to prepare for that sort of takes you to, I guess, to another level in your career. There's a lot of practicing, a lot, a lot of hours, and pushing you on boundaries as well, I guess. And you've put all those skills to good use here in your business at yep. Cuvée Chocolate. So, working with pastry for 20 years, doing chocolate for about 10 of that, um, one of the things I always desired was to make our own chocolate from scratch. Um, it's, it's something that hasn't been done in the very past a lot. So there, there's been a great movement within the bean to bar community. There's a, a lot of equipment available for small scale makers like ourselves that hasn't been available before. So the, the doors really opened up for um, people that want to make their own bean to bar chocolate. Can you explain the bean to bar process? So a lot of people wouldn't actually know how you make chocolate from the bean. Can you go through it for us step by step what you actually do to make your own chocolate? Yeah. In a nutshell, we started the tree. So there's somewhere in West Africa or somewhere in South America, there's a, there's a tree that grows cocoa. It grows in a pot. Um, in the pot, there's beans um, lined like peas. I guess that's what they call them, pots, I guess. Um, the, the, the beans are taken out. There's still a fruit pulp around. It gets separated. It gets fermented. It gets dried. And that's when we take over. So when we get the beans, they're fermented, uh, but unroasted. We hand sort them, we roast them. So hand sorting, we take out what we don't want. There's sometimes foreign leaves. Um, they grow in the rainforest and they, they, they usually get fermented and dried there. So you get your odd little Slated pebble. beans, which are the flat beans. Yeah, you get all the flat ones out. You find beans that are cracked open. Yeah. You want to get rid of those. Um, anything that doesn't look beautiful, nice, overly kidney shape because we don't make a lot of chocolate it has to be perfect every time so we're quite quite anal about what goes in, into our chocolate and whatnot um, so get all the dodgy beans out and we roast them what would be the maximum temperature for roasting at the moment the maximum temperature we use is about 160 degrees, 162. Okay. So it's quite, it's hot and quick. Yeah. But it's not crazy hot. So if you compare to, to coffee, I believe coffee is close much hotter. After they've been toasted or roasted, we um, actually set them aside for 24 hours to completely cool. And then we um, push them through a machine that we call a cracker and winnower. So in that machine, the beans get cracked into little nips, which are sort of tiny little pieces. And the, the outer shell of the, the, the cocoa bean, which is called the husk, gets winnowed off. So basically by blowing Blown away. away. Yeah. And what we're left with is just the pure coconut, which is just the roasted cocoa bean. So what's interesting is that it's actually more expensive to roast the whole bean, but by roasting the whole bean, you're gonna have much more control over the flavor. The reason why it's more expensive is because you'll always lose a percentage of the cocoa butter or fat into the husk or the shell of the bean, but you'll get a much more, more even roasted flavor. Where if you can imagine the nibs are a little bit uneven in size, so you can have a really strong roasted flavor. And in fact, sometimes even tannins that are released in the chocolate, which is bitterness, because you've over roasted the beans. But by roasting the whole beans, you've got a much better quality finished chocolate. Interesting fact about the waste, so we got about, in, in, on a good bean we get about 15 to 20 percent waste that will be winnowed out. Now, saying waste, we can't make chocolate with it, but it's not really a waste, as in we actually pass it on to a local manufacturer of olive oil that makes a chocolate olive oil with it. So 
while we call it wise, it's not really wise. It's still put to still good use. Still utilized. Um, after all that, the, the nibs get um, basically put into a, a wet grinder, which is um, a bit of a modern resemblance of a, a grinding and conch in one machine. And that's where our chocolate gets made. So it's stone ground for, depending on the chocolate, for about four to five days. And um, that and sugar is chocolate in a nutshell. So you grind it for four to five days to bring down the particle size so it's smoother on the palate. Yeah. So for example, if you were to grind for a day, it could be quite coarse and... The first thing you notice when you, after a day, it sort of starts looking a bit like a, almost like a really liquid peanut butter paste. And if you put a little spoon in it, you, you, you can still, what you taste more than anything is the sugar. The okay. sugar will be still quite coarse. And the sugar is what takes the longest to, to reduce in particle size. And with the machine we have, because um, it is a stone grind, it's a very traditional way of making chocolate. Um, we get the particle size to just below 20 micron, which is, in a commercial sense, it's still quite coarse. You still feel that it's sort of, it has texture to a degree. While it's super smooth, sort of in the aftermath, you can pick up a bit of texture if you look for it. Um, commercial manufacturers use something that's called a, um, a ball mill. So you get a lot quicker, a um, lot finer texture. But um, I believe the flavour is not as great because the chocolate doesn't have ch uh, the, the chance to breathe. There's, the, there's a lot of volatile acids in the cocoa that don't have the time to evaporate because it's an enclosed machine and because that process is so quick. So the other thing that that, that, that crunching process actually does, it does get rid of a lot of volatiles. Which so, is, you know, creates a bitterness in the end chocolate. Yeah, it creates a bitterness but it also can have like a real overbearing fruitiness which you can sort of tone a bit down. By doing that. Stone grinding is quite commonly used for artisan manufacturers of chocolate doing bean to bar and then you've got the ball grinding which Dennis mentioned but then you've got big manufacturers that also use rollers which have opening shoots that will release those volatile acids as well so on a small scale you can imagine how time consuming it is to spend five days to actually refine one chocolate. So how many kilograms can you do at once in the machine? Our machine is about, it's a, it's a 60 kilo batch, but I think when, they're, when they put that label on the machine, they were a bit optimistic. So we put, we put 50 <laughs> kilo on it and we, we sort of save every time. Um, okay, and how many grams are your bars? So how many bars are you getting out of a batch? 70 gram a bar, so a 50 kilo batch. I'm not great at math, but you should be left with about just 750 sort of bars, yeah. 750 odd bars. What's the next step? Once we, um, once the chocolate is conched, it's ready, it comes out of the machine and we actually block it away. So we, we basically age it for four weeks, just for all the flavors to combine and really develop. Um, it gets put aside, stored, we put a date on it so we know what batch it was. And after that, it gets melted down. And tempered? Gets melted down, tempered. We, get a, we use a tempering machine, but you could hand temper, of course. Um, get tempered, get put into blocks, packaged and sent out to the whole wide world. What's the best way to store the chocolate? Um, in the chocolate cooling room. <laughs> well, not everyone has one of those, so if I've got chocolate, what's the best way for me to store it? Well, if you, got, if you, if you buy good chocolate, you're probably a person of exceptional taste. So you're also into your wines, and therefore you would have, of course, a wine cellar or some sort of wine cooling facility. Um, before we made chocolate, I got a little wine fridge, and I keep it in there. So that's at 80 degrees, humidity controlled, happy days. Um, if you don't have a distinct taste for wine and don't have a wine cellar or fridge, um, I would say somewhere cool where there's not a lot of light, in a pantry maybe, but don't keep it next to your onion and garlic because chocolate is a fat-based product, so absorb other flavors. Do not put it in the fridge under, circum under any circumstances. You put chocolate in the fridge, you get a You'll be sugar. very disappointed in people. Yeah. yeah, I get it a lot, a lot. Um, we even have people that um, contact us with a picture of our chocolate and they go, oh, your chocolate looks a bit funny after I open it. And with a picture attached and you go, oh, where did you keep it? Oh, I had it in the fridge for six months. And then you have to explain, please do not keep chocolate in your normal household fridge. It's too cold, the humidity in a household fridge goes from zero to 100 every time you open the door. So chocolate, mm -mm. No. No. And also the temperature difference when you bring it back out, you get movement of the cocoa butter and you can get fat bloom. Yep, exactly. Um, it's just, it's too cold, too humid. A pantry will just be just fine. 
Uh, most people, even in summer, have their house. Air conditioning should, should be fine, especially dark chocolates are quite stable. Thank you so much, Dennis. I've been a big fan of yours for a very long time. Dido, thanks and for coming. <laughs> it's fantastic to have a look through your production and see what you do here at Cuvée Chocolate. Pleasure to have you. If you enjoyed that episode, you will love my channel. Subscribe today for even more tutorials on chocolate and baking. Best of all, it's free, so get on it.